the very roots of eating, of negativity and singularity, including the ultimate form of singularity, which is the whole state of things, a pure violence without object anymore. This is the typical violence of Violence because what happens there is a murder of the real, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. Welcome to this week's edition of the Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour with Cooper Cherry and Taylor Atkins, as always, sponsored by the People's Institute for Revolutionary Semiotics. Before we introduce our guest today, we just want to mention that we've got a Patreon account at patreon.com forward slash M-U-H-H. Consider throwing us a buck a month there, or if not, leave us a nice review on iTunes. Either way, we appreciate you all. Today, Taylor and I are very excited to welcome our guest, Alenka Zupancic. Professor Zupancic is a full-time researcher at the Institute of Philosophy of the Slovenian Academy of Arts and Sciences. is also a visiting professor at the European Graduate School. Her books include Ethics of the Real, Kant and Lacan, The Shortest Shadow, Nietzsche's Philosophy of the Two, Why Psychoanalysis, Three Interventions, The Odd One In on Comedy, What is Sex, and most recently, Let Them Rot, Antigone's Parallax. But Alenka, we are honored and we are humbled to have you join us today. Thank you very much. It's absolutely the same here. I'm really honored that you invited me. Thank you so much. And once again, I just want to flag that I am the resident sophist amongst the two of us. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm affirming this now after reading what is sex. <laughs> <laughs> so you will have to explain a little bit what does this mean for you? <laughs> what do you want to say when you say this? <laughs> Um, I guess I would say that of the two of us, I am uh, I'm less knowledgeable, perhaps I've less less well read than Taylor, I'm less immersed in this material, but I have a fascination uh-huh, with so it. So this w- would be your definition of sophistry. It's not exactly. The, I mean, the I'm well. I, I guess you, you'll see. I, I like to I like to get in these very speculative moments. I think more so than Taylor. So I like to take these flights. I'm very much a fan of sort of the wordplay, puns, etc. All that sort of stuff that a lot of people find very annoying about Lacan. That's the stuff that I appreciate, so to speak. He's a a linguist (laughs) trickster. He does like to, he likes to immerse himself in just the pure enjoyment of of language. Exactly. And, (laughs) you know, I'm not sure um, if I'm the philosopher in this relationship, because I'm not 100% sold on Badu's pitting the sophist against the philosopher and the philosopher is the one that wagers on truth. I'm not exactly sure if I'm the one to wager on truth. So, (laughs) you know, I think this is why I'm a recovering sophist as a, you know, Deleuze is one of my favorites. And as Mm -hmm. you know, truth for him is not necessarily a category that he's so fond of playing with. If it ever shows up, it seems to be secondary to you know, the the free flow of the simulacra, crown anarchy, all that other stuff. But mm. uh, <laughs> but we, okay, go ahead. I was just going to say, we're we're bigger fans of Guattari than, than Deleuze, I think, generally speaking to you. So it's very interesting for me in particular, I think, to these little resonance within Lacan's work and Guattari. So it was nice to see that you had a little section on Deleuze in this book, I don't feel as bad maybe bringing up some of these other uh, Deleuzean, Deleuze Guattarian concepts. Okay, this was more Deleuze, Deleuzean part right. than the Guattari, but it is what it, it was quite essential for this argument. So it's not simply some kind of, uh, because I really think there are some very interesting and deep resonances uh, uh, when it comes to this question of, oh, uh, sure. of the crack, also of negativity, of because very, very often, I mean, people or Deleuzeans simply affirm the positivity and multiplicity against the Lacanians who are all about negativity and lack. But I really think things are more interesting also in Deleuze and that, um, as he also insists, there is this kind of crack that it's kind of essential to multiplicity and to so it's not as simple as that. But yeah, it, so this dialogue or this uh, part of the book for me was also something that really helped me, I think, to kind of try to nail down certain specific point. I thought that your reading of Deleuze was was definitely one of 
it was it was eye opening for me. I'll just say, obviously, the the, the whole of the book of, of what is sex, it's got every page is overflowing with theoretical, you know, enlightenment. But your reading of Deleuze is specifically pointing out this kind of overlooked appendix to logic of sense, right? The uh, I guess it's the mm-hmm. fifth appendix, and pointing out this concept of the crack. And as you point out, Deleuzeans, I haven't really seen any literature on it. So for you to to elevate that to the status of a concept and use it to bring Lacan and Deleuze together on this reading of the Death Drive, I just thought that was brilliant. And uh, it's something I'm going to have to return to again to really ruminate on it. And I appreciated how, as you say, the crack is this fundamental negativity that then allows Deleuze to produce the positive rather than it just being one against the other, right? Because then you have Nietzsche's ass, right? You have the... Mm. Yeah, yeah, precisely. I would like to circle back around. We always like to sort of ask a little bit of an origin story, if you will. You can tell <laughs> us as little as or as much as you'd like, just what sort of got you into, obviously, what sort of got you into philosophy, but what got you into psychoanalysis? What were some of the formative moments in your, let's say, introduction to theory and how it sort of informed what you would be doing today and writing these great books with these encounters of philosophy and psychoanalysis? One short answer here would be simply to say that the same thing that got me into philosophy also got me into psychoanalysis, and it is uh, very much related to this uh, fundamentally one could say contingent fact that I was born in Ljubljana at a certain point in time, and that there was this kind of a really almost explosion of a new kind of theory which combined precisely philosophy and psychoanalysis that just really started to to shake the ground here. Obviously, I'm talking about Zizek, but also mm-hmm. some other people who are less internationally known, but were at, this, at that point very, very active also. And so there were all these not only courses, but also lectures, presentations, also in galleries and movie screenings and so on, that also a larger public attendant. I was at the high school then. You could see that something was going on, and I was not interested in philosophy before because I thought of it as some kind of a boring academic exercise. Yes, yes, I mean, yes. what could you think about it in high school? Yes. Uh, but then all of a sudden, uh, really, it was this kind of revelation when I said to myself, if this is philosophy, then I will go and study philosophy. Yeah, it was a yeah. kind of, uh, but it was, nevertheless, I mean, okay, obviously you can say I had, there was some kind of affinity already there, with this kind of speculative engagement in all also psychoanalysis, but it was also also very much due to these circumstantial to circumstances that I was just at the right age here yeah. in Indiana when this kind of thing exploded. And actually, this made me think, you know, there is this unfamous saying by Freud, anatomy is destiny. You, yes. you know this place. Do you know that this is actually a paraphrase of Napoleon? No. And, uh, yeah, it's a paraphrase okay. of something that Napoleon said. And it's very funny because Freud makes it twice in the same text. And the first time he says this, it's not at all in relationship to this different morphology of genitals. This mm-hmm. is the second time that got really famous. Okay. But the first time that he makes this is in relationship not to the difference between the whatever genitals, but to their location. Namely, that they are situated, literally, he says, between, you know, shithole and urinate. <laughs> yes, okay, yes. And he says, and what the reason I'm pointing this out is that Napoleon, the, the Napoleon's saying behind this paraphrase that uh, anatomy is destiny is geography is destiny. Mm, so yes. it's the location of the, you know, it's not, so it's interesting. And so I just want to make this connection to my location and to mm-hmm. <laughs> the way my, my geographical location also played a certain point in this. Uh, but yeah, no, the it's interesting to see how these things kind of are very often more interesting when you look at them closely than if you just take all these things that are circulating around uh, yeah. in terms of criticism or or not. But anyway, yeah. I really like how you frame this because a lot of times we like to ask this question in a personal way, but you immediately answered in a way that situated yourself in a zeitgeist, in a place, a geo-philosophy, if you will, right, in terms of uh, you were at the right time, right place, and there was something in the air, there was something, there was a lot going on. So situating it in the broader culture as this kind of movement 
that swept you along. I find that a, a very compelling way of, of answering this more personal question and immediately making it the social thing. And I, I really like that. Yeah, and what's more, it is true. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it really did happen in this kind of way. So the social dimension was um, kind of uh, leaning on on us at that point also. I mean, it was really this excess of uh, excessive or meaning in good sense, surplus of uh, something that was taking place. So it was not, I mean, uh, so that the then gets the curiosity, which then generates the lack that makes you pursue <laughs> mm-hmm, <laughs> the, mm-hmm. the thing. But it all started with something, an answer to something that there was no question formulated. It was an answer first and then questions kept coming. Uh, at least this is how it uh, it happened also for me. I like that. And I know that Cooper and I, we've discussed this a little bit. And one of the things that stands out specifically in a work like The Shortest Shadow is when we're thinking about, say, someone like Zizek, you give a lot of credence to, to Nietzsche's work and you find a lot of resonances with Nietzsche's work and Lacanian psychoanalysis that that Zizek may rather want to focus on Hegel or or something mm-hmm. like that. So, what was it about Nietzsche, for example, that that sort of became important for you to to sort of give a Lacanian sort of resonance with? This is a very good question because, uh, yeah, it is not very common among Lacanians yet yeah, to to dedicate much time to Nietzsche, although Lacan does have uh, several kind of sporadic, but nevertheless remarks to right. concerning Nietzsche. But it's, uh, I mean, it's again a kind of combination of something that uh, clearly was there as a kind of uh, interesting point that roused my my philosophical also passion and curiosity because I did, the first time I wrote something on Nietzsche was already during my studies. I mean, I was mm-hmm. kind of into the Retustra then and trying to, to make mm-hmm. something out of it. I was trying to pursue a thread. I wasn't even sure what I was pursuing. But anyway, I started, I did write something on Nietzsche back then. I mean, this was still in the 80s. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then I got, I mean, I didn't think or write about Nietzsche at all for many, many years. Mm-hmm. And then it was a very strange, again, coincidence, which made me return to Nietzsche. Namely, I was translating Badiou's book on St. Paul. Oh, yes, uh, yes. And okay. if you remember, uh, he quotes Nietzsche, Nietzsche a lot there. Uh, mm-hmm. There are lots of quotes from Nietzsche. And as a translator, I needed to find the Slovene passages. I see, so I see. by default, I ended up rereading almost the whole of Nietzsche or enough That's wonderful. Of Nietzsche that it kind of re- re- resuscitated my, this mm-hmm. kind of uh, interesting, uh, I, I really want to say more about, there is something interesting going on here I, and I want to say more about it and try to articulate it in some way. And yeah, as the title indicates, the thing that intrigued me most was precisely this uh, notion of the minimal difference of the same so to say yeah. or the the shortest shadow as i also call it in the title as something that is uh, that for me was also a kind of a new and uh, very very interesting ontological approach to difference obviously mm-hmm. uh, pairing with the less to some extent at least but precisely something that also i felt needed to be differentiated precisely as this kind of a pure difference from this endless sliding of differences and multiplications and so on so i guess you could say that in a way it was the same thing that kind of nags me in all my books and in all my work, this kind of how this negativity combines with multiplicity, mm-hmm. not as its opposite, but precisely as the third moment that kind of makes sense of this difference between one and multiple by precisely undermining it as this whatever binary difference on that. This is what I was pursuing in Nietzsche and reading him against the more obvious postmodern topics uh, and uh, semblances. And, and so, so because I really think that in all his craziness, and I use mm-hmm. this term positively, he is really, uh, what I say in the book, he's not this kind of knave, clever guy, ironic, blah, blah. He is it's a fool who is pursuing yes. something, and he is serious about some real that he wants to make appear in a certain way. And I mm-hmm. definitely am and was attracted to that part in Nietzsche. 
which is more like a, you could say, the Kenyan part, but it's a, it's also something that he has a rather unique way of formulating uh, without I know, endorsing everything that, uh, but this particular thread, this particular inquiry was really what to, has driven me through this, uh, whatever, study. Yeah, I was noticing some parallels, you know, since we, Today, we are going to talk mostly about what is sex, but I just wanted to say off, off the top of my head, I was noticing some parallels between the shortest shadow and what is sex. One of them was this way in which you discuss him with a, a painter I had to look up, I didn't know about. Uh, is it Malevich? Malevich, that, yeah, yeah. In your introduction, you kind of point out how Malevich could, if we consider Nietzsche an anti-philosopher, which I know is one of Badu's ways of thinking yeah, of him, yeah. and Malevich is this anti-painter, you kind of point out what, for you, the anti could be distilled in. And I'm trying to remember exactly how you put it, but you say something about how it is sort of finding, locating, isolating this point of impasse, impossibility, and using that as kind of a leverage point for this locus of creation. And it made me think about how you discuss Lacan and, and his drive towards formalization, which is precisely this means to, to inscribe or to sort of capture the paradoxes sort of inherent in the real. I was seeing a kind of juxtaposition there, and I was wondering if when you kind of put it this way, it's, it's precisely to think these paradoxes and to struggle with them, if that if you still see that as a kind of locus of creativity and creation. Yes, I mean, definitely. I think it's also, I mean, even if you look at both decides because for me and i'm sure we'll be returning to this we mm -hmm. already started with it at the beginning this kind of a quasi opposition between matims and pans or wordplays yes, uh, yes. and and a mathematical formalization i think lacan's point is precisely I, and i think uh, jacques milner jean claude milner mm -hmm. he has this uh, i forgot in which text he says it but he he says lacanian pans are all matims. And mm -hmm. I think this is a very important. It's not simply joyfully sliding and producing all these kind of uh, connections and association. They have this effect of actually really naming something very precise. Mm -hmm. It's not simply that, uh, you know, it's like in a joke, a punchline can be very equivocal. Yes. But the point is transmits is uh, univocal because it, it kind of mobilizes this heterogeneity precisely to point out the lack or the paradox or the contradiction that involves all this equivocity. And I think Lacan is really not uh, to be kind of divided between these two tendencies because I think what he shows with his teaching also, but also with his like theoretical claims is, yeah, how there, there is this negativity that is the site of creativity mm -hmm. in language, but not only in language, let's say in art in general, mm -hmm. but he also points out how precisely the same thing is the creativity in, let's say, formal mathematical sciences. Because mm -hmm. for him, formalization is not what the way he sees it, it's not just a way out of all these ambiguities of language, because the more it advances, the more it produces paradoxes of its own. And mm -hmm. it is by trying to resolve these paradoxes that it advances, that it then becomes this highly sophisticated and interesting system. But it's again, what is the science of creation is precisely the paradox, the negativity in the sense. So it is there, then new theories then arise. It is there that Cantor could arrive and say, uh, yes. voila. So it is not just some out of some strict work of uh, formalizing things further and further, but replying to the very paradoxes, very impasses of this formalization. I think both in mathematical or formalized, more like scientific sense in the sense of artistic creation, we could say that there is this negativity or this kind of uh, mm -hmm. thing that is the very locus of creation. I like how it got to the heart <laughs> of your intervention in the co-authored work of Badu and Cassine, which is okay. kind of what we alluded to earlier about where Cooper is saying he's, he's the sophist and maybe I have to play the, the philosopher. Your intervention was to say, it's not about choosing equivocity or univocity. It's not necessarily about yeah. sort of choosing the puns or the, the math themes as though 
you had to choose exclusively, right? That, you know, you're quoting of Milner saying that the puns are math themes. I think that that gets to the heart of it. And if, and it, we may do Lacan a disservice if we don't take the pun seriously, which I know is one way to, to do it and just treat it as, as you said, as jokes without content. But I've, we've also um, seen a tendency to downplay the math themes and say that Lacan was just fucking around or didn't know what he was doing. When yeah, I, th- yeah. I think that, that there, there's something, there's a lot to be lost in either take and trying to split Lacan, so to speak. Mm. No, I, I, I really think so. This is why yeah, I wrote this chapter that you just evoked, because I think that there is something that gets actually lost or obfuscated if one just presents this almost as this yin yang, you know, this kind of two positions that uh, in which, because I really don't think this is the Lacanian real is precisely that to say or to claim that these two things are in a way indissociable. It's not that you can just uh, normally formulate in two positions because then mm-hmm. you would have, yeah, then you would have like a binary position between mm-hmm. uh, whatever. But this is precisely not what he's he's saying, that there is a real that they share, that it's a real that is they're common. I was going to bring up brief Stirner <laughs> because what's interesting it. about Stirner is, you know, just to go back to this notion of the negative and its impact on the creative aspect. I mean, the creative nothing for Stirners. I think it's that very thing, which of course I think sort of the soil of Hegel, roughly, you know, to just kind of approximate is is why that sort of resonates across the two, which, you know, not a lot of people would make that connection, but there's a there's a handful of us that enjoy both. Coop, you've always said that Lacan is one of your favorite thinkers because of his creativity. Uh, that too, Dwayne, yes, absolutely. Dwayne Russell, you know, he's written on Stirner and Lacan, but the creative nothing, I think, is a is a nice crystallization of this. It's very interesting. I mean, this goes to to like object ah. I think maybe mm. there's some type of connection there, but we can you know get into that later. I'm sorry to well, interrupt. Yeah, you. yeah. No, no. The result. We were just giving you a second. Uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, we can return to this later because I think it's also not only simply about negativity, but also contradiction as negativity. So not, mm. not this kind of some kind of. Uh, oh, but we can return to this, and then yeah, I can. I think it's past this thing that I had. <laughs> Uh, hopefully, about this question of uh, mathematization uh, versus sophistry or equivocity versus university, I really think that for Lacan there is something that these two actually have in common. It is precisely because you cannot say the real in this direct way. Yes, you have, let's say, different ways of going around it. But both these two ways are, at least for Lacan, nevertheless, kind of. Um, stay true precisely to this uh, imperative, to this idea, to make this real speak in a way, mm-hmm. to, uh, to make it enter, even as possibility to make it enter the scene. So, uh, and in this sense, I think, uh, yeah, it's important not to simply play one against the other. And here again, it, what I said before about Nietzsche, this was also the equivocity part in Nietzsche that interested me, mm-hmm. precisely the one that through equivocity, pushes towards a certain real, which is not simply some kind of empirical reality, but precisely the kind of uh, contradiction of this reality problem. So so it's uh, in this sense, it's interesting. And I think the, another way in which Lacan expresses this is when he talks about really carefully choosing the words of one intervention or trying to listen to whatever the other to find out what is the word that could work, that could make waves. So this is not simply properly naming something, Mm -hmm. but precisely listen to what is the word for this particular person or for our social setting. We could also say that kind of picks up on all these contradictions and equivocities that are bugging us and kind of bring them together in a way that this really then resonates in some way and makes things... uh, perhaps loud enough for them not to be overheard anymore. So I think it's one more way. So in this sense, for me, it really doesn't, I mean, I understand the mathematician in Badiou and okay, here there is another layer of this, Mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, his claim, of course, that um, ontology is mathematics. I mean, it goes further than just, um, but still, I think that Lacan clearly saw and all the time, all through his whatever teaching, his uh, writing, Mm -hmm. 
he was really working with the two with the two so and i don't think one there is any point trying to force him at the gun point so now choose one of of the other because he doesn't kind of see them as essentially different so yeah. or something that uh, leads into completely different directions you actually set up my sort of next question brilliantly because i was really struck by this this notion where you quote Lacan and he's saying he, he learned everything from his analysands, right? Which is about this mm-hmm. listening, you know, Freud himself, Freud talks about this evenly suspended attention, right? To the, to the discourse of the, the of the patient. And uh, the quote, which I really thought was interesting, where it was, it was about choosing words well enough that they haunt the analysand, right? Mm-hmm. And, and I guess uh, I wondered, do you feel that this is, and now I know he's he's teaching and trying to train analysts when he's talking about this, mm. when he's talking about choosing the right word that will resonate and the elected signifier that will work. Do you feel that this, though, can be extended? Because you end the longest chapter with this notion about, how do I put it, this notion about naming, naming mm. in such a way that there can be this this resonance with the real, such a way that there can be, that we can find these words that work. So do you feel like this, this Lacanian, this Lacanian notion of, of an elected signifier, a word that works, do you see that expanding to your own teaching, your own lectures, your own writing, or do you think that can be beyond the practice of analysis? Yeah, I mean, this is a crucial question. Uh, and it's true <clears throat> that at the end of the book, I do venture something uh, very shortly, very briefly along these lines, in this uh, direction. And I still think that um, without there being any kind of direct mapping of the two, Mm -hmm. but that there is something to be at least not only said, but uh, something that we could think about along these lines. So when, first, if we start uh, with this kind of analytic setting and what Lacan is saying there, there is this important notion, not only, I mean, we try to have this yeah, suspension of, uh, so you basically, all words should be on the same level when you mm-hmm. listen to them. You don't, and this also means you should not kind of try to, you should really try not to be biased by your theoretical kind of uh, knowledge and you say, yeah, I, I already know where this leads. I already know. Sometimes it does lead there, but not always. <laughs> so right, it's right. not uh, in the, this kind of expansion. And also because what is important, it's not how a certain word that the analysis says resonates with you as analyst and your knowledge and whatever, but how it resonates with them. Because it could be a completely different word that you would use. <laughs> to, right, right. To this. So the idea is that you listen, not simply in this kind of um, whatever idolatry of listening, we should listen to each other and so on, but to really, really listen in the sense also to be able to to detect something that is going on mm-hmm. and to use what you hear uh, directly, because this is the point. The point is that you use the word that you hear that comes from the other, not your own words, but that you use it in a way that then can resonate in this particular universe in a very different way that it would perhaps uh, for you in your... So, so it, in this sense, I think it's a new, interesting way of intervening. Obviously, there are other ways of intervening in analysis, including silence or whatever. I mean, this is not only about words. But here, Lacan uses this term, word or signifier or whatever. And then now if we think about, let's say, the social sphere, which is not at all a different sphere. I mean, as analysants, we are social beings. It's not that even though there is this kind of a one-on-one setting, mm-hmm. the all of the social is there. I mean, this is yes. what Freud, I mean, this is how, this was basically what Freud's theory on hysteria, whatever one now makes of it. But this is what, the social is there. The social symptom is there speaking to me through this person. So it's not simply, although there are all these um, singularities involved, but mm-hmm. it is not something that is just individual. So it is, the divide is not, uh, does don't, not run like this in this kind of a position, in a sense. So we could obviously also note not treat the social or the society as a patient or an analyst. It is mm-hmm. not that there are some politics who would be analysts and would be, I mean, so the, the, the social dynamics is not the dynamics of the couch. It is different. But I still think that it happens when there are this kind of 
social movements that mm -hmm. um, make a difference that are not that what occurs there not through some intervention from some instance which would be who's just neutrally listening to everything but that within of the social all of the sudden a word emerges that kind of captures all these different uh, malices and pains that people have in mind when they feel this kind of social discomfort mm -hmm. and that kind of precisely not that it prioritizes one struggle over the other, but that in a way kind of uh, touches them equivocally, all or at least uh, many of them, nevertheless, in a, what appears at that particular time as a single struggle, but not at the expense of other struggles, but precisely as something that can mobilize people across many different divides. And mm -hmm. I think sometimes we see that there is this kind of, okay, not necessarily, I mean, there are examples are from microcosm to more uh, microcosm, but for instance, the, the way in which this famous line, I can read breath, you know, when the, the, uh, resonated, when this cup was literally suffocating the, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the guy, uh, it was, I can't breathe, was kind of not only all of the sun this didn't resonate exclusively and only with the race issue, but also of many, because many people, I think, felt and still feel at this moment that they, they hardly can breathe. And it's oh. just, but there was this kind of a visible problem in whatever, injustice and act being committed. And the way then that the, this quote circulated and mobilized mm -hmm. people for a moment. I don't say that it had now, I mean, like it didn't change <laughs> the system, but it was a moment yes. which was uh, kind of, it kind of captured something beyond what it directly referred to. And I think there is this kind of a surplus metaphoric meaning, which is not metaphorical in the sense of uh, it's precisely a way to referring to a real, to something that many things have in common. So uh, in this sense, I would say that uh, one could, uh, as you asked or suggested, think about the, the social questions and problems to some extent also in, in this way. But uh, mm -hmm. as I said, the social dynamics is obviously different than the dynamics in the clinic. It's not uh, simply... Uh, but people intervene and it's some, sometimes it just happens. So somebody says something without even, you know, themselves knowing what they really said. And it really just uh, has this effect of, yes, that's it. That's it. This is so it uh, happens also without training. <laughs> I think, and it, but perhaps you can say that there is some a talent of a good politician in this sense, not in the sense of political management, but in the sense of, Politics, as we one called it, um, now I don't think there is any politics around, but it's, uh, it's precisely this talent of being able to listen and to intuit and to name something in the, in the social sphere. So, and this, to some extent, is similar, although not kind of identical to psychoanalysis. Or I mean, some of what you were saying, especially about at the end about politics and the social, I was thinking off the top of my head of you know, Lenin and theorizing slogans, right? And that being mm -hmm. at least tangentially related to this attempt to to find the word that haunts and that strikes, right? Mm -hmm. That can't, as you said, that can't be ignored. And I suppose you brought up for for a second there this this sort of the excess of of satisf satisfaction, the excess of enjoyment. And what I think really came out for me reading your work was this notion that in finding that right word that works, part of what is going on is trying to sort of cut off the enjoyment mm. that is attached to that, mm. that compulsion to repeat. And so I guess that would be part of the, the question in this, in this production of, because as Lacan says, it's like analysts shouldn't just be just be babbling. They need to find a way to make their words count, if you will. And some of that, though, in the what in the production of of a new master signifier that can sort of block that enjoyment. I'm wondering, you know, I I was playing around with with puns. I was trying to think of it as exjoyment or or a disjoining <laughs> of, of enjoyment. But I'm wondering. I guess that part of to link this to sex, I suppose, is 
if I can make this jump because we haven't even, I guess, talked about it or, or even defined it. Which no, I but know, I think this is, is fine. It, I, I, <laughs> yeah, I I suppose that that would be part of. Is that? Do you think that's also related to? Oh, gosh, how do I formulate this? This this very fact that, as you kind of put it, what sex isn't embarrassing because of something that's there. It's actually because of this lack that is potentially exposed, right? Uh, I mean, your your example of Adam's navel yeah, yeah. Is, is a great way to end the book, but um, I kind of jumbled, jumbled up a lot. I'll step back. This, I guess, start with this question of sort of enjoyment. Of, uh, enjoyment. And, uh, disenjoyment, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, no, this is, um, I think, extremely important because the way I see that the way I understand this, it is actually the part of the not only the work of uh, analysis but also of this finding words that work and intervening not only with words but in the way that kind of have the effect of a certain shifting in the subjectivity and subjective positions and so on is I think really connected to the fact that these interventions, this work makes certain paths of enjoyment no longer useful. Yes. That uh, because obviously enjoyment and particularly enjoyment as repressed in the sense of verdrängung, not in the sense of like social oppression, but yes. uh, like repressed enjoyment, it is it would attach itself to all kinds of things. It won't simply stay somewhere far back. It will re-emerge and keep re-emerging in connection with things that uh, were not at all part of well, the constellation where, let's say, it uh, originally popped up for the first time or when the, the subject discovered. So it is this question of to what extent a certain repression not only disallows us to enjoy, but actually busts new ways of enjoyment. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and this is also the problem because then we hang on these pathologies of enjoyment more into our symptoms more than to anything else. I mean, so to work with this uh, psychoanalysis is not simply about liberating the enjoyment for, mm -hmm. from all the repressions and so right. on. It, right. it is also <laughs> liberating enjoyment from its own grip, to, so to say, in the sense of what, what, paths of signification it could take and some of them really incredible in order to to get its word heard. But once this word is heard and if it kind of nails a certain point of this enjoyment, then this path becomes inoperative because the repression that enables this enjoyment can no longer be maintained. Again, this is not simply about revealing some saying, okay, but in truth you want this, in truth. It is, everything is about this work, about this naming that actually makes this impossible without necessarily being some kind of a ultimate revelation. Okay, yeah. this is what, uh, but precisely enabling the subject to not enjoy it in certain ways not because uh, it is improper or because but but precisely because this is not so i mean because what is in the foreground there are some things which are not there for themselves but pre precisely because they can be vehicles of this uh, enjoyment and we see this in the level of kind of social pathology even more i would say i mean this kind of manifestations of collective enjoyment are a very often an obvious stand-in for something else. And this mm. something else is not some personal deep sexual satisfaction, but precisely something that within the social edifice does not take place and it's not satisfactory, so to say. So, right. so it's, uh, and I think so the, the both dimensions or both uh, directions of this analytic work are quite important uh, to kind of also so it's not that at the end of analysis then we will fully enjoy and enjoy without hindrances it doesn't work this way and it and i think this is precisely why it is also socially interesting because otherwise mm -hmm. it would only be about liberating us from the social so that we can enjoy in peace i mean and i don't think this is what psychoanalysis is about it kind of came clear to me, one of the refrains, if I may use that, in your work that I found intriguing was you spend a lot of time, you've written at least two essays on Freud's very short essay, Negation, and you, um, one of the, the parts that you like to quote is this notion that just by bringing up 
to mm-hmm. the to the patient, the repressed content, the repression isn't lifted because mm-hmm. of this. It takes more, I guess one could say, working through hasn't even begun once the repression hasn't been lifted once the content has been shown. So there has to be something more that intervenes than merely, as Freud may have thought very early on, is, mm-hmm. is like through hypnosis, for example, and suggestion. He, he very quickly moved away from that, but he thought that uh, if you could just show the real uh, thing, <laughs> yeah, if you could just show it, then then you yeah, would, yeah. then you would solve the problem. Mm-hmm. But you haven't you haven't begun to what bore the hole mm-hmm. in the network of signifiers or or begun to constellate a new network. That's still work to be done. No, absolutely. I think uh, this was really a crucial discovery for Freud when he realized that it doesn't simply work this way, that there are not simply just like two levels, you know, like manifest and latent, and Mm -hmm. you just kind of map one on the other and everything fits into its place. But that between the two, there is what he called then the the work of the unconscious or repression as precisely this work, not simply as uh, the kind of container of repressed thoughts, Mm -hmm. but also all these um, mechanisms from Verneinung to, I mean, there are, there are all these notions that Verwerfung, Vertreibung, Vertreibung that Freud uses, and it's are, they are, so the, the unconscious and the, uh, the notion of repression are not simply about something hidden from the conscious, mm-hmm. uh, but about how they operate there and how they nevertheless make themselves hurt or felt through, yes. through many, many different things. And a very important thing to stress here is precisely that I think it is, uh, yeah, this is Lacan, I think, that defines the unconscious as the knowledge that doesn't know itself. Right. So it's not about not knowing. It's not simply that, you know, the subject knows <laughs> that a thing is repressed. It's not the question is not the question of the absence of knowledge, but rather, let's say, of its topological <laughs> location. But mm-hmm. again, not topological location like hidden in some cellar, but precisely placed in such a way that it never directly comes to the surface, but exists in all these other ways. So I guess and this is clearly what Freud, I mean, this example of uh, Verneinung is a perfect example precisely of that you can sometimes speak of that thing that is still unconscious, that the, the, mm-hmm. the unconscious is still there. And then, of course, there are these other modalities of this, and I've been working recently a lot on the question of disavowal, which is not yeah. its not exactly the same thing as, as for nine, as negation, but it's even more explicit in the sense that the classical formula, as you probably know, of disavowal is precisely to say even, I know very well, but nevertheless. But still, there is... A certain unconscious at work here, although it is not hidden deeply in uh, whatever, but it's uh, precisely something that as part of what I nevertheless do, in spite of this knowledge that I have, that talks to, that uh, testifies to me not really knowing what I claim that I know. And uh, so, and I was really thinking about this a lot in the context of all these recent crises, whatever we call them, including the, the climate crisis and mm-hmm. so on, and how perhaps the, or COVID, and so how perhaps the crucial problem that socially we are dealing with here is not so much like straight out denial, saying, okay, there are people that say COVID does not exist. There are people who say climate change does not exist. But I think the way we still go on as if, they didn't exist is precisely by acknowledging them, but going on with our business as usual, yeah. as if the, so with our practical life. With I mean, not only ours, but precisely in this case of the big players of I mean, people who if they can make thousand million dollars in um, today, they don't. It's not that they don't care about the climate change, but they're engaging in this business, making a million dollars today, even if they die tomorrow, is precisely a way of not looking at the fact that they probably will die tomorrow or <laughs> the right. day after. But so it's not. So th- this is interesting, and I think it's precisely all these things complicate. I mean, this is well known, but it's uh, this portrait of the unconscious of repression, something that simply needs to be lifted and shown in full light Mm -hmm. and all the problems will disappear. No, they will will not. I like this linking to surplus value because, and disavow, because as you say, you know, 
we know very well, but we are going to extract surplus value. It's similar to Freud's thinking of disavowal, which at least in one of the most celebrated contexts is in the development of fetish, right? Yeah, I, yeah. I, know, I know very well. And yet, and of course, with the fetish, there is an immense source of surplus enjoyment. Mm-hmm. And Freud's, mm-hmm. Freud even says, hey, yeah. you know, the pervert, quote unquote, the, the one with the fetish doesn't come to analysis to get the fetish solved mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. it in fact gives them a more direct access to, uh, I forget how Zizek puts it, but he says something about the, the fetishist, nothing makes the fetishist sadder than having to have the, the whole woman rather than rather than the, the desired the part. Fe- yeah, yeah. This is crucial. I mean, I've been really working a lot on this lately, precisely also revisiting this famous Manunis piece on fe- yes. uh, fetishism, because I also think that there are some important structural changes that occur within the classical notion of disavowal and so on, but perhaps we can touch this later. But basically, yeah, what is really interesting with disavowal is this kind of, yeah, you need already, as Freud noticed, they don't seek psychoanalytic treatment because they, they don't feel unhappy because of their British, right. they even bust with it. This is what he says, that, uh, that they, they kind of say, oh, but I have this kind of a <laughs> fuller erotic life on his account. Yeah. So it's not, it doesn't constitute a problem for them as it does for, let's say, neurotic right. person. But it is also, and okay, this would probably necessitate a longer development, but the, Basically, what I'm trying to argue theoretically is also that this enjoyment that you mentioned, this enjoyment in fetish, is precisely the means of disavowal. Mm, okay. Because uh, I enjoy or make the other enjoy, right. there is no lack in the other. <laughs> I mean, I'm really I cutting see. it. Uh, I but see. it's really, it's not only that uh, it's a kind of, not only in spite of this I enjoy, but it actually, the, the enjoyment is here employed precisely as a means of disavowal. And so is also this kind of, uh, the role of knowledge in this new configuration is uh, is also interesting because the more I listen to this kind of arguments, the more I have the impression that people very often think that uh, there is this idea that it is enough for one to kind of flag the fact that you are nobody's dupe, that you are not an idiot, that you know very well how to right. stand. And that this in itself is already kind of excuses you from taking this knowledge seriously. Because it's mm-hmm. enough to know, not to be in the camp of the poor suckers who just don't know. Right. But it is as if flagging your knowledge would be enough or would, again, even this knowledge function as a kind of fetish that allows you to go on as if uh, believing that, I mean, as if what you know were not true or were uh, kind of, uh, was, would be, is derealized in this in this way. And uh, and there is also this kind of interesting displacement that takes place with disavowal because, uh, and I take this example I, from the movie, Don't Look Up, you know, you have yes. this yeah. one newspaper headline, which says something like this, I'm not, I don't remember literally, but something like the deadly comet is about to hit the earth. Will the Super Bowl take place? <laughs> and for me, this is interesting because it doesn't say there is no deadly comet, blah, blah, you know, right. we sometimes too quickly jump on these uh, cues, you know, of conspiracy theorists and denials and so on, which are there, obviously. But I think the the most common, the most general mood of disavowal, which we all kind of participate in yes. to some extent, is precisely this kind of logic. It says, mm-hmm. uh, okay, the comet is here, but so, but will we still get the Super Bowl? So this, is, this kind of uh, practice is precisely disavowal uh, at work, and it's not uh, about not knowing what will hap- happen, but yeah, it, it operates in a different way. You brought up conspiracy theories, and recently, I think this year, you edited the what objective fictions? I believe is what it's called. You yeah, had, yeah, the, the book, you, yeah, about uh, yeah, objective you had fictions. A, you had a short essay on on conspiracy theories. Do you see? You seem to be saying that conspiracy theorists don't necessarily function under disavowal, but there's something something deeper in in their enjoyment, if you will, of not being duped. Or there's there's something because, as you point out, uh, one of the things I remembered was you point out that that the conspiracy theorist goes down the rabbit hole first with skepticism yeah, yeah. and disbelief, but then it crystallizes at some point. 
Yeah, no, I think this whole question is quite interesting. I mean, it's just, yeah, as you said, it's a short essay on this. And it is, I was kind of um, trying to to follow and to kind of uh, formalize, conceptualize a certain logic, a certain functioning on different levels of this concept uh, within the, their own function of, of, of conspiracy theories. So this avowal is there, but it is, I mean, this is something that I actually came to a little bit afterwards mm -hmm. when I already published this article, when I was thinking precisely, again, perhaps of this movie, Don't Look Up, and some other ways, because I think there is a strange complicity between conspiracy theorists and the so-called normal business as usual mainstream. And or or what they themselves called the elites, the elite right. that there is a strange complicity between the two in the sense that what the the elites do, they say, okay, there is this deadly comet. Will the Super Bowl be here? We will mm -hmm. make it happen. And the conspiracy theorists seeing this, that actually the elites don't really believe series <laughs> because this, otherwise they that they kind of don't really believe in the kind of disaster the, the threat that uh, they acknowledge they say okay obviously they are not so stupid so they this is all a conspiracy the threat right. is not real so the the very crazy unconscious of the elites constitutes a proof for the conspiracy theories that there is no real threat. So instead right. of saying, no, they really are so crazy. I mean, we were all die because they are so crazy. They kind of say, no, but they cannot be so crazy. And for me, one of the dimensions of what happened uh, during this famous, the effect of this famous da uh, Downing Street partying, you know, when they were partying during the COVID and then almost the, the right. Johnson almost got uh, fired. I mean, fired <laughs> they were over this so the fact it's not only about what was commonly pointed to namely this obvious difference between some people who can do it and others who were right. punished because of it so the, the rules do not apply in the same way to everybody there are these elites and politicians that can make so this is one aspect of this but if you look at this more naively you say another lesson of this partying is that if they party in this way they clearly don't believe that there is right. a serious threat and so, so it's and, not and so only it that up. they believe they can get away with it in the eyes of the law but they don't believe that they kind of uh, obviously the, the, the two are not since this is still COVID it's not like some directly fatal disease it's only kind of uh, kills some people here there so they could say okay I'm not uh, the, the risk is not direct I should restrain for parting so as to protect others as well as well. but nevertheless I think that there is this kind of message saying but look look at them they are parting not only because they can afford to because they, they, they are elites they won't get uh, punished for it but also because they clearly don't believe that this threat is real so and we are the fools Right. They're fooling us. So I think that this is kind of a, my formula is this, that kind of conspiracy theories then enact, embody the very unconscious of the elite. Yes. <laughs> you know, right. I see. I see. Uh, yeah. So in the, there is this kind of, uh, but uh, yeah, but there are many other things that one can and should say also about uh, why there is this kind of explosion of conspiracy theories in this moment, this social moment and so on. But uh, it's this disavowal, but disavowal also, I would say in their case, more through the other mm. who kind of <coughs> fully acknowledges the threat on the surface, but nevertheless continues with the business as usual practice, still believing that yeah, this or uh, everything will go away if we just do some small adjustments here and there. And that this then constitutes some kind of, uh, yeah, complicity, as I said. You speak about how it, it ends up erecting an other that is not inconsistent, that is somehow whole. And I guess that I had a follow-up, but I guess I, I lost it for a second. Then We'll step back for a second. I, I do think that it's interesting, the relations that, that you're drawing out. We can circle back to some of my questions. I don't want to hog with, with the ones that I put on top of yours. Sure. Immediately off the bat, one of the first quotes in the book, What is Sex, is one about where you just kind of discuss sublimation, which I thought was really good because for me, I kind of had this, because uh, I guess I should provide a little bit of context. I had this idea to write a book about Twitter in particular and how the enjoyment of, of tweeting. It was a good distinction. It's not that you're sublimating. You're not sort of getting enjoyment out of 
joy of speaking or tweeting or whatever communication is not a substitute for a sexual type of pleasure, but it is sexual and it's no matter what, like there's not this mm. distinction, I guess. Does that even make sense? Um, I all, don't know if you'd the, like to speak to this idea of sublimation as it the, pertains yeah. to language. All the drives are sexual, right? Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or even there is only one drive. <laughs> yeah, right. right. <laughs> yeah, because no, the, the point is precisely this. This is why I started with this question of sublimation, which still is considered um, also among any psychoanalyst, I would say, in this kind of a more classical way of substituting uh, right. some original or whatever enjoyment with, with another. But here, I really think that there is a kind of a Lacanian breakthrough in relationship to, to this notion, which is not simply to say, okay, but there is no original satisfaction, so everything is already a sublimation. It's more interesting than this. It says that actually sexual satisfaction originally is this declination from itself. Not mm. that something is lost uh, and then uh, trying to get recopyrated through, through different means, but it's simply that this gap, this minimal difference in what is constitutive for enjoyment. You cannot enjoy without it. it it's not simply that so, and but this very gap, this lack, is also what then opens up kind of sexual territory or mm. territory of the sexual within all kinds of different practices that are not sexual in themselves and that, that are not sexual because they could be reduced in the last instance to some sexual thoughts, but precisely because they keep open or they keep working precisely with this gap of a double satisfaction. So there is uh, mm -hmm. there's something besides what is directly said or given, it is precisely the, the surplus satisfaction is there. And it is not sexual because it refers to sexual organs, but because it kind of implies, contains, follows this logic of internal redoubling, which I think is the very logic of uh, of the sexual. I mean, I, I think this is in, in my comedy book, but I, I have this line, you know, that we should say that for humans, even, even sex is sexy. You know, it's not yes. simply, it's, uh, this is, there is this kind of inherent redoubling. We, we talk about sexuality, not simply because, uh, but it's, there is something sexual about sexuality itself. So to say, if you talk about some, whatever, physiological um, satisfaction of some physiological need, it is immediately redoubled by this, its own shortest shadow, so to say. And this is what, for me, the, the sexual is. So uh, this book of mine is not about uh, sexual advice or sexuality <laughs> in this sense. It is, it is everything uh, contrary to this. I mean, it, this I already heard, I mean, when it came up, there were some people saying, but you killed all the joy for me. With it. <laughs> uh. <laughs> if I did this, then, uh, <laughs> then the kind of, of what this book was intending came across, not to kill joy, but precisely to address this question as an ontological question and not simply as a kind of uh, trying to uh, analyze different juicy details of, of our um, sex lives. Right. So, I think you, you formulated at one point about how since sex is not a, sub a substance and it doesn't have any one particular domain, it can infiltrate and it does infiltrate all the others, right? Yeah, it's, yeah. I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but... Yeah, it, yeah. And I was saying to Cooper, and I don't know how you would feel about this, but I was saying that that the title itself, What is Sex? At the end of the book, you might think that it's kind of its own uh, twist. It's its own joke in a certain sense, because because it's not something that can be answered straightforwardly as, as though one could point to it, right? In, in a what is sense. No, no, precisely because I mean, the way this title came about is actually a funny story. When mm -hmm. I ended the book, I mean, I mean, when I finished the manuscript, I ended up with this kind of boring title that, that was my <laughs> working title, but basically it was really kind of a boring title. I think it was Sex and Ontology or something like okay, that, Sex yeah. and Ontology. And then when I sent the manuscript to, to the editor, then now he's no longer there. Roger Conover, he really read the manuscript uh, overnight. <laughs> it was yeah. kind of an interesting way that how quick he got back to me. And he said, listen, but just the title, no, 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 this, I, you know, I was up almost the whole night and yeah. I all of a sudden remembered that, and I Googled, he says, you know, that there is no book saying that there exists no book 
with this title, what is sex? <laughs> interesting, <laughs> interesting. Kind of, and then I said, okay, but still, you know, my emphasis is not to tell people what is sex, but yes. it is precisely the emphasis is on ontology, on the problematic status of this is, of the of the being there. Right, right. And so the compromise, which probably is lost of all the readers who don't know this story leading up to it was to put the east in italic you know so if yes. you look at the cover it is what is sex so right. uh, not what is <laughs> so, uh, yeah. but, but, but the whole point precisely was to show how this notion of sex that we all think we know what it is and where it is and so on is actually much more slippery and it's a ver the very veil vehicle of some ontological contradiction and yes. or even being as contradiction. And so this is also why, to some extent, you know, I keep kind of switching in the book between, let's say, the inconsistency of sex, the fact mm -hmm. that besides, let's say, the obvious external inhibitions and prohibitions, but, but there is that also it is a problem in itself, also mm -hmm. to some extent, regardless of what suppresses it socially, but that this is precisely where the social kind of gets into it. So that mm -hmm. it's not the social and sexual are not simply two opposites. But I think it I switch in the book several times between the inconsistency inconsistency of sex and let's say the incompleteness or whatever, and the name, the sex as the name or concept of the inconsistency of the symbolic structure So right. you know, this kind of thing that that also already John Kobjek formulated that sex is not simply a incompleteness meaning that is incomplete, but the very impossibility to complete meaning. You know, it's the right. it's, so it's not exactly the same thing to say, okay, but the sex, you know, it's this thing that keeps evading uh, every meaning and so on. No, for me it was more important, and this was the kind of ontological investigation behind it to also say what it is, not only what it isn't and how it... So in this sense, here the, the ontology part comes with this kind of saying that the non-relation is, you know, <laughs> not that right. there is no relation, it's just right. that, but that, that this no exists in a very concrete and palpable way in the world that uh, in our sexual world and uh, practices or whatever. So it's, uh, but it's, uh, I noticed when I yeah, finished the book that it was uh, kind of uh, moving between these two things, which I really insist saying that they are kind of not the same for me, but they, they are both talk to the same impasse, uh, address the same kind of uh, point to the same impasse. Is this why you also at times sort of equate sex with the unconscious or with the real because it is this impasse of being or because it is this inherent contradictoriness of being? Yeah, I mean, okay, this is then the even more perhaps um, complicated argument which as you i think formulated it uh, earlier on kind of combines this uh, epistemological yes. negativity the lack of knowledge with the lack of being yes. uh, in one in the same notion or yes. one thing or non thing that is sex yeah because i was precisely trying to i mean i started out by investigating what binds sex to the unconscious in Freudian theory, what binds it there, particularly if we don't simply take this as self-explanatory and that we say, right. okay, it's normal that sex get repressed. It should, I mean, there is this kind of immediate reflex that we don't even question. Right. Okay, but why? I mean, why? I mean, there are many dirty things, so-called, which are not necessarily repressed in the same way. And we shouldn't simply presuppose that culture kind of naturally represses sexuality as sexuality. Again, what is this sexuality that it represses? What is in the sex? Obviously, there's been this uh, huge there are these huge archives of uh, different ways of regulating uh, sexuality all through history. I'm right. not uh, <laughs> denying this at all. But precisely, um, my point was to ask this more specific point, what is it in sex that demanded, that necessitated this kind of, uh, and still does, this kind of uh, massive regulation and trying to find a better way of uh, whatever. And uh, it is here that I was led to also this other negativity or this other thing that you brought up, namely that, and which is there in this uh, Adam's Naval example, yes. uh, that, that there is uh, 
the, what is really problematic about the sexual is not something that we can see there that mm -hmm. is such a horrible or distressful sight, but precisely something that we do not see there. And that kind of um, shakes a little bit or puts in a very different perspective the sex that is there around this. I mean, mm -hmm. so it's, uh, and I don't, the point here and the reason and why I insist on this is precisely because I think there are there are many and there were many struggles of sexual emancipation and so on, which clearly I think precisely did not really work because they tried to they didn't pay enough attention precisely to this point. You know, yes. to this point that it's not simply you can say it all, you can show it all, you can uh, do it all. Okay providing that you don't hurt anyone and so on, but still that um, what is this all <laughs> that we are looking for? Uh, right. What, it is as if whatever we see, there is still something missing in what we see. And so instead of kind of um, working with that, uh, we often try to force sexuality to, to spit it out. <laughs> but yes. There is nothing to, to, to spit out in this sense. So, in this, so this then... Yeah, led in the book to this combined interrogation of uh, epistemology and ontology, and mm -hmm. uh, which uh, yeah made me say that sex is precisely the intersection of the two in the sense that the two kind of legs overlap here, so that it's a, right. a kind of a empty intersection of, of these two, or also if you want of nature and culture. It's not yes. that it's half nature, half culture, and or some nature modified by culture. It is a missing link in na nature that catches on, that is caught into the missing link in culture, and then poof, the whole thing yes. explodes into what we call sexuality, humanity, whatever, uh, real sy symbolic, uh, imaginary, and so on. But the real, I mean, the nodal point for me, it's precisely this kind of um, yeah, short circuit, topologically speaking. Yeah. Would you characterize that as something like Object A, uh, because I was just thinking about, you know, and just looking at the RSI diagrams, I was looking this up because I kind of, that's the sort of association I made because you often see, you know, you can see here, you always have the, the little A in the center of these, of the RSA yeah, yeah. diagram. And it's almost like it's this locus, it's that sort of represents this productive scission within, I mean, I don't even know how to yeah, articulate yeah. that quite. No, no, no. Uh, no, it's uh, good that you brought up this question because, yeah, obviously, I think that one of the, uh, there are many, but like, let's say in this kind of really quintessential novelties or conceptual inventions of Lacan is precisely this notion of the concept, uh, object A, which is not about objectivity. I mean, because it's really things done, conceptualizes a whole new dimension of objectivity. Mm -hmm. That is to say something that cannot be reduced simply to fantasy in the sense of imagine, imagining something, imaginary play, or to the symbolic as identity, as difference, and so on, but something else that is, has a very peculiar, again, ontological status, but it's never, but is there, and it's part of our reality. It has a kind of, it is an object, but it's not an object like other objects. But, uh, and the very, and I think this is a really kind of conceptual coup de force of Lacan to come up with this notion of object, object A, which also did not simply, I mean, it appears relatively, I mean, not really late, but I think not before seminar eight or something. I don't okay. think there is a really up to this point, even in the ethics seminar, I mean, perhaps it's not something that is there. That's okay. Uh, uh, in, in this, uh, so, so then it gets a much more like full conceptualization, conceptualization probably in the seminar eleven. But it's uh, what I wanted to say is that it kind of um, also in Lacan, it is not immediately a kind of a ready-made concept. He kind of uh, thinks of this, and then the, the the way he conceptualizes it through time also changes a little bit, but mm -hmm. with this uh, result or this kind of a really overwhelming conceptual importance, which is uh, that kind of help us think of a different reality. And I think that this is not, it's not coincidence that I think it was one of the concepts that also Deleuze kind of uh, caught up with immediate, I mean, he, I know there are passages where he says something like this, that there, this is the, and even uses the the concept because, and I think this was a kind of a real novelty. So it does, um, as you show on the, uh, on the picture, 
name this nodal point, but there is also this question of, you know, I think I have this quote in the book about how these different objects, A, as Lacan calls them, are also kind of representatives of this uh, fleur, of this crack that is yes. the essence of the object A. So that the, how they, so we, with this notion of the object A, precisely, we come back to some of the things that, uh, yeah, we were discussing at the beginning. What I find so interesting here is that just to kind of relate this to Deleuze and Guattari particularly is you can almost see they describe the desiring machine, which I'm almost thinking the the A could perhaps be construed as like a, I mean, Guattari calls it a machinic A, which I think sort of makes sense. It's this kind of productive process to borrow from Deleuze a little bit. Oh gosh, what was I going to say? It was yeah. something about how they describe that the subject is sort of a residue that is on the exterior elements of the desiring machine. At, at the center is almost this, they don't call it a negativity, but I mean, you can even see in this no, the RSA, I think, yeah. the RSA like literally yeah. kind of is almost a diagram of what I would consider, you could possibly say this is a, this is what a desiring machine would be. It's like, it's sort of yeah, this yeah. residue around this constitutive negativity or gap or cut, yeah. whatever, however you want to express that. Yeah, except that I think that uh, they and perhaps Guattari even more so wouldn't say this. Right. I mean, it is. I have my reservation with this desiring machines and sure. this productivity because precisely one of the things that I'm trying to articulate, and I think they are articulated to some extent absolutely in Deleuze as well, is precisely how, and this is not necessarily a kind of, I mean, how this sometimes romantically sounding productivity, creative productivity is actually always predicated on some kind of negativity. Mm, and this yeah. socially can mean not very really pleasant things sometimes. You know, there is also this kind of a surplus value that you right. could describe in the same way. There is this surplus value, everything is um, getting around. And uh, so there is, I mean, it's too late to now engage seriously in this because they're, they're, these are conceptual issues that would demand much more subtle discussion than just kind of uh, acceptance or refusal. But there is a question of precisely, so I think what, I at least this is how I understood it, what Taylor was saying earlier about this dimension of analytical intervention with also which also cuts off certain paths of enjoyment mm -hmm. and yeah. certain kinds of productivity i right. mean because not all productivity is let's say in itself right the sign of the good and i think Certainly. this is at least i i, re I see this often in the list that this is there are these words which are in themselves designators of the good, something good, multiplicity, productivity. So, and I think at least I, I have this, my ear trained more, more to kind of also detect perhaps some cracks within this. And mm -hmm. uh, so that it's not necessarily everything that is productive or is good. And that there are creations that are also erasures of some things, which is okay, but it's not, one cannot, I mean, pretend that, uh, so, but okay, it's about, it's a very, very complex uh, project of this ontology of productivity in some of which is Deleuze's and I think that there are some books like Difference in Repetition or also The Logic of the Science which are really marvelous in this way and they, they kind of uh, are much more complex than, than this and uh, mm -hmm. yeah. I think about this in terms of, or I've been thinking about this as the drive as sort of having, being agnostic. It doesn't, good, bad, pain, pleasure, it doesn't really, it's irrelevant. It's about the intensity of it, of the experience or whatever the intervention is kind of how I've thought about it. Obviously, mm -hmm. that can be, you know, yeah. if you're if you're agnostic towards pain or pleasure, then obviously you can see how that can become, mm -hmm. you know, a sadistic pleasure, et cetera, yeah. and so forth. Yeah, no, I mean, my point was not that, that I mean, obviously... I just thought that there is something about certain words that are being, uh, when I said good, bad, in the sense that there are good guys. I mean, there is this kind of distribution of uh, uh, bad guys and good guys that I guess all every theory makes. Uh, but uh, yeah. and, and I think in Deleuze, you have this uh, the usual suspects of uh, whatever bad guys, and then the. But anyway, yeah, no, I think yeah, agnosticism is still another question. I mean, this is because or the question of the relationship between difference and indifference but uh, yeah i don't know <laughs> perhaps uh, we can keep this for some uh, for some other discussion because uh, it, 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 we've covered a lot of field here yeah it, it, it has been an hour and a half you've been very generous for the time and obviously we we could uh, ask you a million more questions but you know it's it, i think i think what we have is 
is very good. I just off the top of my head, I really appreciated your use of Laplanche, for example. But again, mm-hmm. that would that would open up a you could do a whole episode on on that. But I do think that what we've covered today and what we got into, we really appreciated you spending your time with us. No, thank you very much. I mean, this was also for me a very, very how to put it, a productive discussion hey, in the yes, best nice. possible. Oh, good, <laughs> good. good. <laughs> so, no, that's good. And and I, I'm, I was glad to hear you bring up some of the things you're working on now, specifically with respect to disavowal and you know, all we'll, be, yeah. we'll be we'll be looking forward uh, to that as well. And just to let you know, we'll we'll be publishing the episode in about two weeks. So, mm-hmm. but we'll we'll send you an email when please do when, yes. when that's out. Yeah, and uh, and again, I just want to thank you for being generous. No, and thank you really because this was uh, for me also very thought provoking in the way you kind of forced me to spell out certain things. I really really appreciate this. So uh, excellent, so thank you. That's an amazing. And we'll we'll. We'll keep in touch anyway. In- yes. That's an amazing compliment. And we just want to thank you once again, Alenka, for joining us. And that will wrap up this week's episode of the Machina Unconscious Happy Hour with Cooper Cherry and Taylor Atkins. The very roots of eating, of negativity and singularity, including the ultimate form of singularity, which is a This is the typical violence of information. It's violent because what happens there is a murder of the real, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. With nothing left but recycled, whitewashed, lobotomized people, as in a block work orange.